let's go over our, our international signals here. Thumbs up, either in reactions or in real life, means I hear you and I understand you. Thumbs horizontal means almost, but not quite. And thumbs down is, I need you to say it again or a different way. And a wave means I have a question or you can unmute yourself, but we do have you muted to help improve the sound quality. We had a bit of a technical snafu last week and the last bit of class didn't get recorded. So I'm going to extend class by 10 minutes today. I'm gonna to do a review of what we did at the end of class last week. And you know what, reviews and repetition work. So that's a fine idea for all of us. And then I wanna make sure we get a full hour in to do the wrap up today. So if you have to jump off, um, and can't stay the extra 10 minutes. Completely understandable, my apologies to you. This was um, the best solution we could come up with under the situation, so we're being resourceful, which is all we can do in this day and age. Mm -hmm. So here we go. One more visit with my, I've fallen in love with this here. For gleefulness, living in balance, what does that mean? We've been taking a look at Mr. Alexander's discoveries about mind-body coordination. It's really a path of self-discovery. We pay attention to ourselves to get out of our own ways, to reach our full potential for buoyant balance and effectiveness. Um, so there's my website one more time. And last week we were talking about Bending and reaching with ease. And I love this little tyke. If you have any small children in your life, this is how they bend down. They don't need an Alexander teacher. They haven't learned to interfere with their coordination. And what I wanted you to see in this picture was he's curious about something. And he's bending very clearly at his hips and his knees and his ankles, right? As opposed to unfortunate, whoops. Uh, I'm going to go forward one. Unfortunately, what we start to learn as adults is hinging at our waist, right? So no knees and ankles, right? Only at the waist. And this is a picture of Mr. Alexander on the left using his hip joints, his knee joints, his ankle joints, teaching a young one. She's in what we call monkey. She's rotating her torso around bent legs. Uh, Mr. Alexander is doing more of what we call a lunge because his back leg is relatively straight and he's using more of the bend in his front leg. We talked about headlights and taillights, which is my way uh, to get you thinking about this use of your whole torso over your legs. Um, and so I made something up. You don't actually have headlights and taillights. I like how that works with my analogy of um, taking the parking brake off of our inner Ferrari, right? We work at our best when we reduce the resistance. So if you all join me for a moment in our first experiment for the day, and just lightly put your hand right on the top of your head, please. So sometimes I ask people to kind of think about where your soft spot was as a kid, as a little infant, before that all kind of grew itself and knit together. You had a little soft spot there. And sometimes I, I like to think of that as a blow spout. Whales are these beautifully ginormous creatures that move with such buoyant grace. And then when they breathe, right, they come up to the surface and they kind of blow out the blow hole, yes? And that has a beautifully free energy upwards, yeah? So I want you to find, I'm calling that, I want you to imagine a light coming out of the top of your head there. And I'm gonna call that your headlight. And I want you to play with a minute, shining the light in different directions. So I want you to know where that light is hitting the ceiling of you. Or if I, if I drop my head down, now my headlight is in front of me. And if I collapse in a slump, then my headlight is now behind me, right? It's not right over the top of me. So just play with that kind of awareness of where your headlight is for a moment. Right. And next, 
we're going to partner an awareness of the orientation of our head, which I'm calling your headlight, with an awareness of the orientation of your pelvis. So, your, what I'm going to suggest is that you pretend you have lights on your sit bones. So if you go to the, put your hands underneath your seat, you're going to feel the rounded rockers of your pelvis, your ischial tuberosities, are right down here, right down here at the very southernmost tip of your torso. And no matter how much padding you have, if you put your hands under your tush, you're going to feel only rounded rockers. So your sit bones, I'm going to pretend have lights as well. And those are going to be your tail lights. That's not your tailbone. Your tailbone is your coccyx, which is here. Your sit bones are below that. So I don't mean to be confusing in my movement analogy, but by tail lights, I mean your sit bones and where they're pointing. So if you join me for a moment, my sit bones right now are pointed underneath my stool. My sit bones are oriented right straight down below me. If I slump, right, my, my tail lights are now pointing in front of me. Try that with me, please. So when I'm standing up and free, sitting up and free, my tail lights are straight underneath me. When I slump, my tail lights go in front of me. It's really funny. I can see all your heads sinking. <laughs> Right? So now float our headlights up towards the ceiling and let your taillights be opposite of your headlights. Now if you're a person that's been trying to sit up straight and you overarch, go ahead and push from your sternum forward, you're going to notice that your taillights go behind you. Mm. Right? We don't want that. So now what I want you to do is your headlights in relationship to your taillights. And we want them opposite of each other. It's not a straight line because we have curves in our spine going forward or back, but we want the orientation of our headlights, our whole head, and our taillights, our pelvis, to be opposite each other. So if I slump, my headlights went forward and my tail lights went forward. They're not opposite. If I over straighten, my tail lights are back and my headlights are back. They're not opposite. If I float my head weight up and back in space to be over the middle of my middle, I've got my headlights opposite of my tail lights. So if I rock forward in my chair, I want my tail lights to be going in an arc along the floor behind me as my tail lights are doing an arc on the ceiling in front of me. They're opposite each other. So try that for a moment. If I'm actually bending at my hip fulcrum, my headlights will be opposite my tail lights. Please notice that I didn't ask you to hold yourself straight. Why? That's a different idea. It will yield a different result. If you hold, if I said hold your back straight and now tip forward, give me a thumbs up if you can feel that you efforted more to do that. You got tighter in your movement. Yeah, I see a lot of thumbs. So now I didn't ask you to do that. In fact, I want you to free your neck and lift your head Merge out of your tortoise shell as your legs and arms free away, and then aim your tail lights away from your headlights as you rock on your sit bones. Beautiful. Beautiful. Then you can actually breathe and come forward. 
So if we understand headlights and taillights, yes, to get out of a chair, I want you to notice what it looks like when I don't do that. So there's my headlights going faster than my taillights. And then what I want you to see is I'm actually going to have to push quite a bit to get out of the chair. Try it with me. So purposely don't move your taillights, just move your headlights. And then where do we have, guys? We have movement at what? My mythical waist. And I want you to feel how much work it takes to get from this position to get out of the chair. So I call that the harumph moment, technical term. Harumph, so I have to push. Now let's do another experiment. And we're going to use the idea of headlights and taillights to free ourselves of pain. We're using a hip fulcrum because we're letting our taillights go back. And we keep headlights and taillights away from each other until we're on our feet. And when we push, we bring our taillights underneath us to bring our head up. Hmm. So I'm curious. How many of you thought, I'm getting some thumbs up, I haven't even asked yet. Thanks for that. <laughs> Give me a thumbs up if you use less effort to get out of the chair. I'm loving all those thumbs. It's a, it's a sea of thumbs, a chorus of thumbs. Yeah, and if you're not sure, I have a very simple, very consistent response, which is please, by all means, do the experiment again. I love how a creative process of inquiry is actually the same as a, as a scientific process. Mm -hmm. Scientists are not supposed to know the answer to their experiment before they begin. They have, they have an educated guess, they have a hope, but they have to repeat that experiment over and over. Yes, they have to be open to actually finding out what happens. And so I don't want you to believe me, I want you to use this information to do the research Keep observing yourself and find out how it works best for you. Oh my gosh, I love this. Someone's saying they tried the turtle shell uh, on the golf course the other day and it worked beautifully. That's the, my favorite thing about this toolkit is it, it's applied to any person in any situation. And it's always fun to hear about your experiments. So thank you for sharing that. Someone earlier commented that they couldn't squat all the way down to the floor like the child, and I get it. Um, I've lost a lot of flexibility because I stopped using it. As a dancer, I used to roll around the floor and get up and down and jump and do all kinds of things. Um, but here's the thing, let's do a little mini monkey. You don't have to get all the way down to the floor in a squat to be able to use the principles of buoyant balance to help you, right? So no matter where you are, you might be compromised. I have a shoulder injury right now. You might have a back that's compromised or knees. And you know, let's face it, we're lucky enough to live long enough. We're not built of titanium. We are gonna wear things out a bit, especially if you've used them hard. If you've been riding around with that parking brake on, you're gonna wear things out faster, or you might be genetically more disposed to wearing things out. But wherever you are, no matter what's compromised, cooperating with the way you're designed to move and reducing that resistance is gonna help you function to your full potential. We're not all going to be um, concert pianists. We're not all going to have perfect pitch, but I can tell you from my own experience, if you keep listening to music, you'll hear more, which is fun, by the way. My volume is still weak. I have no idea. Let's see, I'll take that out again. Does that help if I take the mic out? I'm not sure what to do. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me now, please. Okay, thank you. Guys, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to fix it, but thank you for the feedback. Okay, let's go back. 
So there's my Ferrari. We're gonna take the parking brake off our Ferrari. Our Ferrari has headlights and taillights. The headlights and taillights are opposite each other. And then this guy's doing a squat. This is kind of an athletic squat, but you'll see his headlights and his taillights are opposite. His hips, knees, and ankles are all bending to get in that chair. And I call that zigzag legs, back in your ankles, forward in your knees, back in your hips. Okay, let's see, did I? Oh, and Arielle, somebody had a question about their knees going inward. She was wondering if there's any suggestions to keep her knees from going inward when she stands up. Yeah, so that inwardness is a pulling at your hip. Though I do have a recommendation actually, uh, which is to kind of practice the tracking of your knees. We can all do this together. One thing that happens when we sit for an extended period of time is we start to sit still. We kind of collapse in, so that's into my tortoise shell. And then I want you to notice that when you do that, your legs are actually pulling in as well. So if you'll remember my tortoise analogy, the tortoise doesn't just pull its arms in and doesn't just pull its head in, it pulls everything in. So when you collapse down, your legs are actually pulling in. See if you can feel that. So if we all go in, we wanna all go out. So when I let my head float up and back in space, I'm gonna let my back widen, I'm gonna let my arms free away towards my hands, and I'm gonna let my legs free out towards my feet. And when I say free out, I do not mean push out. So if you'll remember our little experiment with our fists, when we tighten our fists, we're grasping. And when we let go, there is expansive movement in all directions when we cease grasping. So if you tighten your fists and see what happens, when you let go, there's a release. So if I release my legs out and away from my torso, they're gonna to release towards my feet. Yes? So now watch what happens. If I put my hands on my legs, I'm hoping you can see this. If I rock on my sit bones, right? So that's headlights away from taillights. Can you see my hands are actually moving forward in space? It's small, but my femur, my leg bone is actually releasing out and away as my pelvis rotates, right? So if I don't let that out and away movement happen, I'm holding in my hips, my legs might actually start to pull in. So if you take the parking brake off your hip joints, the moment my rockers rock forward, my knees free forward and away, that means my knee joint is bending, my ankle joint is bending, and my hip joint is bending to come onto my feet. So the person that asked about their knees rolling in, put your hands lightly right on your thighs and then right, just let those knees go out past your toes, forward. And what I would suggest is mapping that movement, just coming forward without standing up. So this would be a great kind of restorative mapping movement for you to try your knees to release from your hips out and away. Because you can retrain that pattern. So what's happening to you is your legs are getting pulled in so they're rolling in. Okay. I think we did our wrap up from last week. Do we have any other questions before I continue, Gail? No, I don't see any other questions, but someone said they went to a Cambodian wedding and they were surprised there were no chairs there, but, and people in their 80s stayed in the squat position the entire wedding. And she said she sat in her leg and it went to sleep. So, you know, so it, it is, I guess, like you said, it's a matter of what we're used to. And if we stop using, if you use, if, you know, if you don't use, lose it or use it, I guess, or use it or lose it, I guess, is the, is the way that it works. But. Well, there is some truth to that, and I'm living proof because it's shocking that I just don't get on the floor as much as I used to. And, I'm actually working on regaining that. And right. it's a good idea for all of us. So right. if you're that's a lot stiffer and um, 
losing mobility that way. You don't want to just overdo it and start, you know, doing squat jumps. Not a good idea. Oh, I said we're going to do a little mini monkey. That's what we're going to do. A mini what? Mini monkey. So we're all going to... Yeah, because somebody said that how do we put pressure on our feet? Is that what we're going to talk about now? You are going to put pressure on your feet. So okay. So headlights and taillights are in opposition. Okay. Forward and my knees are freeing forward. I get more weight in my feet, which is great because I want to push from my feet. If I don't use my headlights and taillights, if I use my mythical waist, right, there's my headlights without my taillights, where do I push from? My legs, but I'm also pushing a lot from my back and my shoulders and my neck. If I use my headlights and taillights and I get that weight on my feet, when I push, I'm really just pushing from my legs. So give that a whirl. Join me in standing, please. We talked about this a little bit um, last week as well. If this is my kitchen counter, a lot of us will stand with our hips leaning into the kitchen counter. And then a lot of us will bend down from the fulcrum of the base of our neck and our mythical waist. And then a lot of us sadly will get back aches and maybe not want to cook anymore. So if you don't want to cook anymore, that's great. If you don't have to, don't. But I hope you're not stopping that activity because your back hurts. So instead of being right up against the counter with our hips forward, because when my hips are forward, my shoulders are back, and then I'm going to drop my head. So we're actually going to leave one hip at the counter, and we're going to step the other foot back in 70-30. So I'm going to remind you what that is. There's my kitchen counter. One foot's front, one foot is behind it, but it's not straight behind like this, like a fourth position. My, my wannabe ballet dancer from last week. The back foot is wide and deep, right? And the back foot is also turned out. So I'm not trying to stand like this. That's not so comfortable. I'm turning that back foot and hip out a little bit. So I've got one foot up against my counter and one foot behind, which makes me a little further away. Right, so you might think that's not what I want, I have to get further, but how am I gonna get further? Headlights, headlights and taillights as my knees bend forward a little bit. So we don't wanna just do headlights, taillights and not bend our knees because then my knees will go backwards and that will strain you. So the moment I think headlights, taillights, I like all three leg joints. There's my knees. Now they're not bent very much. So if you've got bad knees, you don't want to stay in kind of a squat, but I'm just releasing my knees forward a tad. So if you remember the picture of Mr. Alexander and the young girl, this is what she was, actually he was doing this because this is a lunge, right? I can stretch the back leg to get a little closer to reach something, right? Or I can bend both knees. If I need to be square on, let's say I was rolling out some dough and I didn't want to be open and I had both legs, same idea, headlights and taillights. Oh, I see someone waving. I'll be there in just a moment. I'm actually not sure if you're waving or... Nancy, let us know if you're waving something on your computer. Joanne's asking, how do you put pressure on your feet? You allow the weight to pour there, Joanne. So, Joanne, if you're holding your legs in when you get out of a chair, I hold my legs in, then I don't feel more awakened on my feet. I have to release my legs out and away. There's my legs moving forward. Then the weight gets to my feet. So that may take some experimentation. But we're back, if you have your chair, Use your chair for a moment and just experiment with going 
headlights, taillights with bent knees. This is really good for brushing your teeth or stirring or chopping. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Newtonian physics. All right? I took physics a very long time ago, but one of the laws of physics, I think it might be the second one, correct me, I might have that wrong, is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Let me know if I got that number right. My, my physics teacher is very unhappy that I didn't remember which one, but I do remember the law. <laughs> and actually I have a fun picture here. We're gonna come back to this guy on the walker in a second, but I love this. It was my favorite toy at my Aunt Ushi's house. <laughs> She had one of these and I would watch it endlessly, right? So the ball comes in here and then the other ball is going to go in the opposite direction. I don't know if any of you ever saw that toy. But what I want you to do, um, I'm going to use my chair, but a wall is an easier, a wall is an easier place to feel this. But I'm actually going to push into the chair and instead of moving the chair, I'm actually going to push myself away from the chair. So if I unlock my ankles, if I give my chair, I'm only using two fingers, so I'm not pushing with a lot of force, I'm going to let my body go in the opposite direction. Now if I lock my ankles, if I say ankles don't move, it's hard to do it, and you'll see a lot of compression in me, right? Maybe my back will go back and my neck will tighten and I'm going into my tortoise shell. If I unlock my ankle joints, it's not hard to get myself to move in the opposite direction. It's really easy. So maybe you're sitting on a desk right now. You could do it right from sitting, couldn't you? You could just push yourself slightly back, right? You could just push slightly away. So here's the funny thing. Even if I don't move through space, I can still actively send myself back away from that chair. So stillness is really never still. I can actively lengthen back and away from the chair. And then lo and behold, that happens with whatever I'm touching. So what else am I touching? I'm not just touching this chair. I'm touching the floor. So here's the funny thing. If I don't allow myself to respond to the floor, I might unidirectionally collapse. And unfortunately, a lot of people, when they talk about grounding themselves, do that. They press and they go in one direction. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not opposed to grounding. It's super important. It's important in the wiring in our house. It's important in ourselves. My point is this. Grounding is omnidirectional. Lengthening is not just up. If you think Alexander Technique is all about lengthening, you might kind of unground yourself and look really funny. Don't tell him I told you to do that, okay? If you understand that lengthening and grounding are related as a matter of fact, they're equal and opposite. So I let my feet go down into the floor to let my head come up out of the floor. And my friends, that is the tortoise shell. That is the tortoise shell coming out of itself equally in all directions. It just so happens when my legs go out of my torso, they're going into the floor. But I'm not going into the floor. Did you see me change? Thumbs up if you can tell the difference. Try it in you, no matter where you are. If you're sitting, ground down into your chair. If you're standing, ground down into your hips. Yes? Now, if we were together in a big old workshop, I would make you pair up, and I would make you try to move each other with a small little force. And I will tell you that every time I do that in a workshop, when people hunker down, they are much less stable, and when they omnidirectionally go into the floor to go out of the floor, 
and then someone tries to push me over, good luck. I am so much more stable when I am using Newton's great law of physics, equal and opposite. I go into the floor to go out of the floor and into myself to go out and away. So I want to show you this picture of this, this gentleman, and I don't mean to poke fun, but I want you to look at something in this slide with my gentleman with his walker. Now he's got a kyphosis there. He's probably got something compromised in the shape of his spine, so he can't help all of it. But look where his head is balanced. Way forward, and he's falling into his arms. His shoulders look tight. I'm gonna make an educated guess that his neck, back, and shoulders hurt a lot. Because once your head comes forward and down, it's exerting a lot more downward pressure in the whole system. And instead of your head weight being balanced over the vertebral bodies of your lumbar spine, you now have to use neck and back muscles way more than they are, frankly, built to do it. So if we go back to our Newtonian physics, and if you have a chair or a cane or even a broomstick, yes, what I want you to do is do a little mini monkey, so that's headlights and taillights with bent legs, and then very lightly from your hands, you send your head back and away from your hands. So if I need to put more weight, let's say I'm pushing a very heavy shopping cart. So if I press into the shopping cart, I just lost my headlights and taillights, right? And I'm unidirectional, right? I don't want that. So I let my headlights be opposite my taillights. I use my leg joints. I might even want to use a lunge if I was going to push something heavy, yes? And then as much as I'm pushing into the chair, the chair is sending me back and I push from that back leg and all of a sudden that heavy couch or shopping cart, whatever it is, it's going to move more, but of course, don't believe me, but I would love an email to let me know how that experiment goes. Or maybe you're not going to move something heavy. Maybe you're going to use a cane or a walking stick or someone's arm. I'll never forget, uh, my 96-year-old student was, was taking her husband's arm and she was going to fall over because she was going unidirectionally into her husband's arm. And they liked holding hands, right? So I wasn't gonna tell her to stop doing it, but I taught her the same thing I'm teaching you now, is that you use the contact point to go equally away to put your head weight over your own base, not the walker's base, not your partner's base, that's dangerous to you and your partner, yes? So you're going to use the cane, the walking stick, your partner's arm, to equally go away to put your head weight over the middle of your middle and your base. And now you're going to enjoy that because you're not going to be so tightened up. And it's going to work better. It's going to feel better and function better. Super important because I'm not saying not to use a walker or a cane but I am asking you to pay attention to how you use it. Oh, it's the third law. Thank you for telling me, Cecily. I had a funny feeling. <laughs> 70, 30. Um, someone is asking, do I use the same foot each time or alternate? I don't have one answer for you. Um, in my body, I have one leg that's quite a bit longer than the other. So in my body, it feels much more comfortable to have my right leg back because that kind of evens out my pelvis. Um, if you were more symmetrically built, it would be wise to alternate, but we're not all the same, so I don't have one answer for you. It's an excellent question, though. Um, so this is the kind of thing um, that I just want to let you know uh, that sometimes I need to see you and give you more personalized feedback. And that's why, again, I'm going to encourage you all, my Tuesday morning class at 10, I'll be able to see exactly what you're doing and make a recommendation based on what I see. 
I'm giving you a template of guiding principles that will serve you well, but that's why I don't want you to believe me. You have to keep understanding and finding out. Um, sometimes I make a suggestion and it just doesn't work. And so please don't believe me. Figure out what works. Yes? All right. Gail, do, am I getting at the questions I need to get at? So I had to unmute. Um, somebody asked a question about the, the gentleman with the walker in your slide that's bent over. Is there a way that he can reverse um, the damage? Uh, it depends on what the da so so reverse damage probably not. Um, can he become more upright? Possibly yes. I don't know. I would have to see that person. Um, so kyphosis is a thing. Um, first of all, kyphosis actually is we're supposed to have a curve at the top of our thoracic spine, and the curve is supposed to be to the back. But if I'm like this, then I have an exaggerated kyphosis, and that's what we think is a problem. And that might, um, if my spine is ossified, then I, no one can fix that, right? right. That's a done deal. However, if that person, let's say my spine is ossified, maybe it's even been fused. If I start using my leg joints, that person's head might be able to come into balance. So now I've got headlights and taillights, even within what's ever going on with whatever's being compromised. Right. So there's some things, arthritis is not curable. Right. Arthritis is not curable. However, if you are pulling into the tortoise shell and creating more resistance, that is going to further compromise your balance and it's gonna put you in a lot more pain. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite stories is I had a student with very severe asthma and she um, had a home in the art museum area and she had her office on the uh, bottom floor and then she had another office on the fourth floor. So all day long she was climbing four flights of stairs many times a day. And by the time she would get to the top floor she would be wheezing pretty noticeably very uncomfortable situation. Now I could have recommended that she combine offices, but this was her home, right? So did I cure her asthma? No. There's no one can cure asthma that I know of, and certainly not an Alexander teacher. I'm a movement specialist. What did I help her do? Same thing I showed you today. Headlights and taillights so that when she climbed the stairs, she was doing the, the climbing, the work from her legs, which by the way is a smart idea for us to keep our legs strong. And she did a lot less pushing and constricting in her torso. And when she got to the top of the stairs, she wasn't wheezing. I will never forget the look of glee on her face. She was ecstatic. And I'll tell you what I told her. I don't, I'm not a magic worker. And that wasn't magic. That was you changing your coordination. And if I can help you do that, you can learn to do that on your own. That's a powerful tool. I did not fix her asthma. I helped her take the parking brake off her Ferrari and she was really pleased about it. <laughs> it was fun. I love helping people move more efficiently. It does not get old. I am more thrilled than ever. So you might have a different compromise, right? It could be bad knees. It could be arthritis, a bad back, right? But take the break off your Ferrari. It's a good idea. And it's more fun, right? Well, could you, somebody was saying, could you demonstrate like how to take several steps with a walker? Like if you were to do, because um, I know you showed how to, you know, how to move with a walker, but if you did like, just a few steps, sure. just to keep going so you don't have that tendency to bend over. <laughs> I'm just going to use the dowel which will be like my walking stick, okay? So first I'm gonna show you what not to do, right? So if my head weight moves with my walking stick, can you see I'm bending at my mythical waist and my taillights didn't go anywhere, right? And I've got a lot of downward pressure into that walking stick. So instead, 
I'm not gonna overreach my walking stick. I'm gonna put it where my head weight's still over my base. And then as I push from my feet, I'm gonna move the walking stick right where it's close to me. Yes? So a lot of times I see people moving their head weight, yes, and overreaching. And then the other mistake people make with their walker is they get too close into themselves and their shoulder gets pulled, so that's my neck going forward. So instead of doing that, my head weight stays over my base. If I've got a kyphosis, let your tail go back a little bit, yes? And then instead of getting too close to that, it's too close for my shoulder. So when I come in, I have to move that stick in front of me. So you're gonna take smaller steps. You're not gonna overreach, yes? And every time my walker comes down, every time my cane or my walking stick goes down, I'm not unidirectional. I'm using from the floor, back and up to float my head weight over my base. Not my walking stick base. My head weight belongs over my base. And I'm using equal and opposite force. I'm not uh, using a lot of force. I can use a little bit of force to send myself up and back. I hope that was helpful. That was a great demonstration. That made a lot of sense. Because I, I have seen a lot of people overreaching with their with their walkers and with their walking sticks and canes. Yes. Um, if somebody had a question about climbing stairs, you know how your asthmatic was able to improve. Um, so could you go over again exactly what it was that she did to make it more comfortable to go up the stairs? So it's the headlights and taillights. Um, there's more sound, but um, I feel like uh, the Wizard of Oz right now. I'm going to reach into my bag of tricks. Because I have, do you remember step aerobics? <laughs> I feel like this is your bonus offer, guys. Wasn't on my uh, agenda, but watch what happens to my headlights and taillights. So my taillights are forward and my headlights are forward. Now which happen watch what happens when I try to climb up this little step. There's my body pushing. See my body pushing? Mm -hmm. Now what happens when one of my foot comes up, there's no head weight on that. It's empty. Now, headlights, taillights. Now, I, this is a terrible place to push from because I'm going to push with my forward foot. So headlights, taillights, and now I have to shift my weight onto my forward foot. And then I don't push with my forward foot. I push with my back foot. And do you see how little effort it takes? I'm gonna show you one more time. It's a super fun experiment. It might be better with my other leg. If your head weight drops to your forward foot, you're gonna push with the forward foot and you're gonna push with your body a lot. If you have no weight and you use headlights, taillights, and then I'm not done yet, I have to shift my weight forward onto the forward foot. Then don't push with the forward leg because that's going to send you backwards. You don't want to do a backward flip on the stairs. You push with your back foot. That's my ankle opening. And then that's very little. And then as soon as my weight is on my front leg, what's my front leg doing? Sending my head up and away, equal and opposite. Then you kind of float upstairs. So it's way more efficient. It's way more balanced and more pleasant. Try it, that could be such a fun experiment. If you're living in a home with stairs, instead of going, oh, I have to go up the stairs again, right? Because what's that? That's into your tortoise shell. So then what did you just do? Sadly, you just put the parking brake on and then you're gonna hit the gas. You're gonna make it harder. So if I can get you curious and go, oh, I wonder what I do when I go up the steps, Take a moment at the bottom of the steps to reorient and go, where am I? 
Where's my head balance? Where's my headlights? Where's my taillights? So I think actually this is the perfect segue. I'm going to use it. Because I'd really like to give you a template for learning going forward. Mr. Alexander used the term inhibition to describe the process of stopping unwanted habits of discoordination and then inviting or directing the coordination he wanted. I'm just going to look at you for a moment. He used the word inhibition to mean stopping unwanted patterns of interference. He called those habits so that he could replace it with his directions to come into buoyant balance and to move efficiently. Now inhibition in our modern day language has a very different connotation, I find. And language is powerful. Mr. Alexander used language, but he was writing in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So I'm updating his language. That is my artistic license. Some Alexander teachers are very classical and use a classical approach. It's fabulous. I am not dissing that approach. I am just telling you that I teach from the approach that I do. I'm a modern dancer and choreographer. I went to Antioch College question authority, I got to teach from the place that makes sense for me. So I'm replacing Mr. Alexander's I word, inhibition, for some different ones. And here's my I words. Inquire, so I've got scientists looking in a microscope, right? Inquiry, curiosity. Intercept, as a little girl, my big brother used to play touch football with me. And the most exciting part of the game was interception. What is that? It's changing direction, guys. The ball's going one way down the field and then such an exciting moment when it changes direction. And then invite, right? We do not want to bully change in ourselves. You will just add strain. Sit up straight, work harder. These do not free up your buoyant balance. Where am I? Oh, can I, can I pay attention to myself for a moment? That's an invitation. And can I invite myself to free myself out and away from my tortoise shell? That's changing direction. It really matters the spirit in which you invite. Did you ever invite someone over and go, I think you should come over to my house? Okay, I don't think that would go so well, right? I don't think that would go so well. So when we invite, we make space, right? We make space, which includes, I don't feel like paying attention right now. My teacher used to say once in a while, when you're in the mood, <laughs> tune in. So I offer that. So let's go back to our recipe. So the recipe for buoyant balance, I, I like to use this as, a, as an easy reference. So let's say uh, something's talking to you, your back, your shoulder, maybe you have a headache, you're feeling tired, maybe there's a step that you're not sure about. You're going to check into your recipe, movement direction, movement sequence, and movement quality. Direction, sequence, and quality. So for direction, I've got a picture of our tortoise, right? So what does that mean? So the direction of what Mr. Alexander called lengthening is not unidirectional, it's omnidirectional. The tortoise comes out of its shell in all directions. And the tortoise isn't even quite right because I want you to know you have deepening, not just lengthening and widening. We are truly three-dimensional. So any idea to release out and away, like your fist, you can remind yourself with your fist, right? So you might be reaching for something and you might say, why is my neck saying something to me right now? And you might ask yourself, oh, did my head come in towards my body as I reached? Because most of the time that's what people do. Their head goes into their body as they reach, 
instead of their head going out and away to reach. Right? Especially, you know, light bulbs, right? And especially if you go, oh no, I gotta change the light bulb. So I'm already going into my tortoise shell. I call that the rut row moment. Ah, oh, I gotta pay bills, right? Oh, I'm gonna pay bills. I'm gonna come out and away. See how that goes. That was my little tax preparation experiment I think I shared the other week. That's direction. Qual uh, sequence, I did sequence next. Right, so what sequence? We've talked a lot about locating the place where your head rests on your spine. So give yourself a little reminder about your nodding joints. So your head nods through an axis of where your ears are, where the bumps, the condyles of your skull are sitting in the grooves of atlas. And this is a super important place. Mr. Alexander's discoveries really um, highlighted head, neck, back, poise, balance of your skull. When the balance of your skull is interfered with, it interferes with your whole. So if my head is pulled into my body, right, then I'm not going to sequence movement from the top of my spine because that's the parking brake. So when I release movement at the top of my spine, then my whole spine can start to follow in sequence as it's built to do. If I lock movement, like even if I'm doing good posture, I'm using air quotes because I, sitting up straight is not good posture. So I've never seen someone get up and free and buoyant by sitting up straight. It could change. Maybe tomorrow I'll see that strategy work for someone. I promise to change my my bias, but for now, I've never seen someone get buoyant. They all tightened up, right? And then I'm not sequencing movement from my spine because I locked my head spine joint. So you want to unlock my head spine joint so that my head leads and my body follows. That was our sequence idea. My head leads and my body follows, right, for the postural movement. So if I wanna reach for something, I might not always reach my head where I'm going, but my head leads my body in lengthening to reach, and then my whole body follows. So if you'll remember, if I don't lead with my head, I get pushy movement. So have a slump, gently please, and then sit up straight because 99 times out of 100, when I ask people to sit up straight, they push. They move from somewhere below their head spine joint. And they increase tension. So let's not do that anymore. Let's try a new experiment. We're going to lead from our head spine joints. And if my head is dropped down and forward, my head spine joint has to come up and back in space but I'm not gonna throw my head back. I'm gonna let my head rotate freely and let my whole spine follow. Great, beautiful. I see some buoyant movement going on there. Give me some thumbs up if you're feeling more buoyancy coming in. I'm loving the chorus of thumbs, right? So it just so happens that's how you're built. Mr. Alexander didn't invent that. He discovered that's actually what was going on when he moved more freely, was he was consciously cooperating with the actual physiology. He didn't learn the physiology in a book. He discovered it because that's what works better. That's how you're built. So if I start leading with my head, I just want to caution you. I call this bad Alexander technique. People go, where, where does my head go? I can just put my head in the right place. So does that look comfortable, guys? It's not, right? Because what's going on? I'm leading from my head, but my body is holding on to its old pattern. So when the kite moves, the kite tail follows. My whole body follows no matter where I'm going. Then my voice opens up, my resonators are able to freely vibrate again. Yes, yeah, so my head leads and my body follows. 
in an omnidirectional, lengthening, widening, deepening direction. And then what happens to the quality of our movement? It gets lighter and freer. Sometimes it gets more powerful, right? So we don't want to just over effort. We're, we're living in America. I, I think everyone here is from America. And we are in the super size me, more is better culture, sadly. Because sometimes yes, not always. There's some famous saying that I wish I could quote more accurately. Maybe someone can help me. But if, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then the only problem you can solve is a nail. I'm not saying that right. It's much more eloquent to saying than that. But I'm, I'm in the neighborhood of that saying, yes? We, we need more tools. Someone's going to help me out in the chat. I know it. Someone's going to know that quote. Um, we need more tools, right? Look at this beautiful sea of faces, right? We're not all the same, luckily. We have some commonalities. Most of us have habits of interference that we've pulled ourselves into our tortoise shell, right? If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Thank you so much. I appreciate the help. <laughs> I had the right idea. I had the gist of it. Yeah. So, so we need this beautiful ability to pivot and respond to life circumstances. We have to learn how to teach on Zoom and learn on Zoom to connect to each other right? Have, has anyone else been doing social events on Zoom? I actually hosted a bachelorette party on Zoom. It was hysterical, but we figured it out, right? This is what we got. This is what we use. So you have constructive thinking. Please use it. It's a powerful tool and you don't have to get it right. You're not going to learn everything in six weeks. I can't share with you 32 years of experience or closer to 40 in my own investigations in six weeks, but I'm sure gonna try to give you a template. And then scientific process, they don't do the experiment once, guys. They repeat, they inquire, they intercept, they go, oh, instead of going into my tortoise shell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix it up, I'm gonna go out and away. And just see what happens. So, our recipe for buoyant balance, we're going to consider movement direction, which is a simultaneous freeing out and away in all directions. Sequence, we're going to lead with our heads and let our bodies follow like the cobra or like the kite. And quality, we're going to unleash our inner Ferrari, right, by reducing the resistance to be free and quick or calm or powerful or whatever you're looking for. So I wanted to do a wrap up and I want to give you a context for what we just talked about in terms of Mr. Alexander's directions. So there he is as a, a young man in his 80s looking pretty buoyant and his verbal directions were allow my neck to be free. We're going to take these one at a time. So allow my neck to be free. Why did he start there? Because most of the time when people correct their posture, they add tension, right? They hit the gas before they've taken the park and brake off. So Mr. Alexander's uh, first direction was this idea of undoing the resistance. And so if your first step is where am I? I love a question. Where am I is different than where are you, <laughs> right? Or do the right thing. Like actually ask, where am I in space? Where am I in relationship to my whole body right now? And then just this idea of allowing your neck muscles to soften. So when I ask you to let your head float, that's a quality idea. I didn't say put your head over your middle of your middle. I said, allow your head to float over the middle of your middle. So try that right now. And then say different words to yourself and see which words work for you. Does allow work better? Does float work better? 
try put or make sure is one of my sneaky ones. Make sure I get very sneaky and bossy in my language to myself. And then I have to just invite. I have to say, oh, what would happen if? That's an invitation, isn't it? What would happen if? Great. I can see some buoyant movement happening here, guys. Give me a thumbs up if you're feeling some buoyancy come back in. I think buoyancy is the bomb. I just, we're 70 something percent water. And how much of us would say we describe ourselves as buoyant? Most people look at me and make a very funny face when I suggest that balance is buoyant. And then we start to experience more of it. We get excited. I hope you're excited. I'm excited to see you get buoyant. All right, what's his next direction? Allow my neck to be free in order that my head moves forward and up. So what did he mean by that? Because that can mean a lot of different things, guys. So I'm gonna show you a very bad interpretation of forward and up. I'm gonna go forward and I'm gonna go up. This is not what Mr. Alexander meant. As a matter of fact, he called that back and down. <laughs> right? But I did indeed go forward in space and I did indeed tilt something up. I tilted my face up. But if you look at my whole skull relative to my whole torso, my head rotated backwards and went down into the tortoise shell. So you have to know what Mr. Alexander meant by forward and up. So let's go back to our blow spout and allow your head to just float out of the tortoise shell. That's up away from your torso. Don't push it from your body because you'll tighten up. That's not allowing. You have to free your neck first. And the forward is rotational. Watch what happens to the tilt of my head as I slump. My head is tilting backwards to stay level. So as I unslump, I'm gonna allow my head to rotate forward. I refer to that these days as a Ferris wheel car rotating freely. I am not fond of the direction to tuck your chin because again, I have yet to see anyone get buoyant and free. Can you hear my voice just got compromised? It was awful, don't do that. Why? Because your chin's not a joint, and that's a bossy idea. Allow free rotation around the axis at your knotting joints as you bring your head into balance. Then if I need to look up, I look up. If I need to look down, I look down. I've got a free joint here. Because I might need to look up or I might need to look down. There's not a right place. Do you remember way back in the beginning? Posture is not a place and balance is not stillness. Balance is micro movement and postural balance, yes, is a relationship and things change all the time. Yes? So forward and up in Alexander's language refers to that free rotation and up, which is away from the tortoise shell. All right, I'm going back. What's his next direction? Allow my neck to be free in order that my head moves forward and up so that my back lengthens and widens and my limbs free away. So what's he getting at? He's getting at your whole body following there. He's saying that you don't just move your head, you have to allow your back to respond and your limbs. And I have been using a shortcut of the tortoise coming out of its shell in all directions simultaneously. That's our omnidirectionality today. My new fancy word. Yes, all directions simultaneously. So I have um, rephrased his language, but I've got all the same ingredients in there, don't I? Now, I want to tell you that I had a student years ago that 
looked at me in a lesson one day and said, well, I think about purple monsters. I, I didn't quite know what to say when she said that to me, but I want to tell you something. When that student thought about purple monsters, she freed her neck and allowed her head to move away so that her whole body followed. And I said, great, that works great for you. I never would have thought of purple monsters as a direction. It's not the one that makes sense to me. But why am I sharing that with you? Because we are all creative souls. You do not need to be a visual artist or a musician or a dancer to be creative. You were born with that. Take the parking brake off your creative inquiring minds want to know and see what works for you. I come up with new movement metaphors all the time, and some of them are better than others, and some of them will connect with you better than others, right? But be curious, watch if you've got grandchildren or neighbors, my goodness, they're better teachers than me. They are so buoyant, they are not interfering. They also don't have bills and people they're worried about yet, right? They have less demands in their life. But watch how they coordinate movement. Or maybe you have a pet at home. You will see your cat's head lead and its bodies follow. Why? Because that's how any vertebrate creature is built. And if you don't have one at home, there's always YouTube. We're spending a lot of time online now. <laughs> so be curious, right? Inquire. That, need, that requires your curiosity. Invite. Oh, I wonder how I could do that differently right now right? And intercept. Be willing to pivot and change direction. Try something new. Don't decide that it works well. Find out. Phew. We are on the final runway here, Gail. Do we have a question or two I need to answer before this we wrap is great. Oh, Somebody asked if you could put the quote up, the Alexander quote up again, because I think they wanted to get it. And, and we had several people ask about going downstairs, you know, because you did how to go upstairs. And they were wondering if you could show the correct way to go downstairs. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't have time to do that today. Okay. Here's the, here's the slide. Allow my neck to be free in order that my head moves forward and up so that my back lengthens and widens and my limbs free away. And I want you to know that the way he wrote those, the language, can you kind of see that that is all supposed to happen at the same time? So again, in my tortoise coming out of its shell simultaneously in all directions, his language is additive. It's additive, inclusive thinking. What I wanted to say is I don't want to try to rush through. I'll give you one little hint about going down steps. It's a lot about the equal and opposite. If you unidirectionally drop down to go down, your head weight's going to go over that forward foot. And instead, you're going to go up and back from your back foot. And I'll make you a promise, make you a promise that on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., I will go over going down steps and I will bring my little aerobics step. I'm putting my contact info one more time in the chat and I'm going to share a slide. Tuesday morning at 10, I promise I will talk about going about steps because I don't really want to rush that. But there you go, guys, calendly.com forward slash AT Phila. Tuesday mornings at 10 is my class for seniors. It's called Move Free, Feel Free. There's my website one more time. And I didn't put in my final slide, but I am offering, if you schedule before Friday at the same calendly.com AT Phila website, if you schedule an online lesson for the first time with me, I'm offering it half off, but you have to schedule it. Um, before midnight tomorrow. You don't have to have the lesson before tomorrow, you just have to schedule it before tomorrow. Uh, but then, you know, let's say um, you've got a very specific puzzle to solve. Um, I help people with tennis swings and playing musical instruments and getting into weirdly shaped cars and I did an ergonomic assessment of sleeping positions the other day. Uh, bring it. I, I can help you do all kinds of things. And uh, I'm offering that special to you. Um, yeah, but come join me in class. I've got a class just for seniors. And I love requests. And I can 
address them much more readily in those weekly classes than here because sadly, guys, we went over our over. <laughs> <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to be with you all and to share this work with you. I do hope it's been helpful. Thank you. I'm going to give you all a round of applause. And then I'm going to give you, I, I was trained in ballet, so I'll give you a little reverence. And I do hope I'll get to see you again. Thank you for that back. Um, stay in touch. Let me know how you're doing. Check out my YouTube channel. I hope this isn't the end. I hope it's just the start of the next chapter. And thank you so much. A round of applause for Gail and Friends Life Care. <laughs> thank you so much, Ariel. This has been an absolutely wonderful series. Just wanted to remind everyone it's going to be on our website and our YouTube channel. Our website's at friendslifecare.org. Um, and, and please, you know, follow up with Arielle on her classes because, as you know already, she's amazing and um, she can really help make a difference. So I'm so glad that all of you have joined us. Hope that you've gotten a lot out of it. I know that I've learned a lot. Um, and Arielle, thank you very much. I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday weekend. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. You're so welcome. My pleasure. Hope to see you. Bye-bye. Okay,